So we are in week four uh, of the Church Unleashed series that we've been looking at. And my prayer right now, whether those of you who are here in this church building or those of you who are watching on, um, on, on live streaming, that the Lord will unleash you. And I really believe that God, before the beginning of time, I really believe that God knew you. I really believe that God, before the beginning of time, knew who you are. Knew that you will come into this world. And I'm here to tell you this morning that He loves you. In case you forgot that, that He loves you. And I really believe that. I believe that God really made you. And from the very first time, I believe that God uh, knitted you together in your mother's womb. Knitted you together, knew exactly what you're going to look like and what you're going to be like. And some of you think you might be an accident, and I'm here to tell you today that you're not an accident. And the fact that you're here this morning is not by accident, but it is a divine appointment. He is for you, and He is with you. He knows every heart attack you've ever encountered, He knows every insecurity that you have, that you sort of planted yourself a long time ago. He knows the obstacles that you had and the obstacles that you will have. Even right now, He knows who or what is standing in your way of stepping to the man and woman that God has called you to be. I really believe this with all of my heart. As I was preparing for the sermon, it, it, it came upon me for, for us to realize some of us have forgotten that very, very simple fact. You know, you have more potential in you than you can possibly understand. So I'm praying, God, will you just tell you and reveal to you and show you and whisper to you and shout to you. It doesn't matter how, but just unshackle the people that are listening to your word today. I want you to be unleashed into the potential that God has made for you. Because I know what you were made for and I believe it with all of my heart and I want the Lord to unleash you today. A question I want to ask you that you sort of keep in the mind, back of your mind to the to message today, do you want to be to have a successful life? Do you want to have success in your life? But here's the thing, and I think we're going to have a little bit of a challenge today, because here is what I believe, that you are more valuable and more important than you possibly understand. You have more potential than you possibly understand. And I believe that God's plan for you and for me are not wrapped up, uh, wrapped around our success, our plans. I think God has a plan for us that we live a life of significance. And let me separate the two this morning for you. Uh, because on the one side, success, and success is you have to get it. You have to find that thing inside of you, pull it out, and recognize your greatness. You've got to believe in it, and you have to go after it. That's success. But significance, on the other hand, is a kind of kind of like success, but it's also really not like success. Success, you can be successful and it will be about you and your family and, and your job and, and, and your promotion and all that kind of stuff. That is success. And I'm here to tell you that you can't learn a life of significance and end up being about you. It doesn't work. And I don't think God is calling us to a successful life. I think God is calling us and unleashing us Longing to pull us through a life of significance. And how do you do that? 
Well, we're going to dive right now and look at Acts chapter 16. And we're going to, if you've got your Bible with you, you're welcome to, to, uh, to go there. Otherwise, we're going to have the, the scripture up on the, on the screen, Acts chapter 16. And we're going to look at two examples in Acts chapter 16 of just significant times in the kingdom of God. And who they were and what they did. And we want to see the difference between success and significant. But right now, wherever you are, whether you're watching or right here, I just want to really pray with you. So let's pray. And I want you to, to hold your hands under like this. Okay? And you pray it or hold your hands like this in receiving. Okay? So we're going to pray over ourselves right now and we have to, to break some stuff in us. So Father God, we just want to pray right now. Would you open our mind, would you open our eyes so that the words, the gospel will penetrate us. So that we can really step out our lives that are build around success. And Lord, we want to lean into what you long for us to have, which is a life of significance. Show us this today. Do it in our lives today in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Right, so we're going to start, we're going to dive in into Acts chapter 16, verse 6. We, we've looked at, at some stories in the, in the book of Acts when we started the series because I really believe from the day of Pentecost, God has just unleashed this thing in the church. And, and so we start off and it says, Paul, we, we're going to talk about this. He is this first person on the map. And, and, and he's also one of the most significant people in the Christian faith that I can possibly think of. Millions of people, literally millions of people have come to faith because of this guy, Paul. Paul has lived such a life of significance. So the question is, before we carry on reading, is if we know that Paul lived a life of significance, this is my question. Did he live a life of success too? Okay? Did his life always look successful? Because here's the deal. And let's just carry on reading. It says Paul and his companions. And his companions. Okay, so what did Paul's friendship look like? What does his friends look like? If you go back one chapter before that, chapter 15, which we don't, we're not going to look at, but if you do that in your private time, he had this wonderful and a really good friend and companion by the name of uh, Barnabas. Okay? Now, the two of them, if they're walking to any time, Barnabas and Paul, uh, people were like, thought they were like Zeus and Hermes, which were these two powerful Greek gods in Greek mythology. I mean, they were so powerful that they were this combo of power. When Paul and Barnabas walked into any city, you knew God was going to do something powerful. They were this awesome couple together. Paul and Barnabas. They were so good, uh, a chapter earlier, they had such a sharp disagreement that what happened is that they literally parted ways. And unfortunately, this wonderful combination of the two was never ever the same again. They never traveled again. So it says Paul and his companions traveled. So he's got new companions. And we're going to read about these new companions. It says, so they travel through the region of Perdia and Galatia. So let's talk about what Paul's life looked like. When he went to Galatia, there, there was a town called Iconium. Iconium. And we hear the story of him running into a cripple. And this sounds very... Um, like a successful story of that chapter because we see the scripture and Paul talks to him and he prays over the 
merciful God, and the guy stands up and, 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 and gets healed. And you think to yourself, well, that's success, isn't it? I mean, I mean, Paul prays, the guy stands, and he's healed. But then, an angry mob comes and they grab, they grab this guy, they walk him to the edge of the city, and they push this guy who just got healed from being crippled. They push him, and not only that, they pick up rocks, and they throw it upon this guy until the guy is dead. So not exactly a picture of success, but he carries on and he says, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the promise of anger. So you read this and you wait, wait a minute, Paul was being kept from preaching? I mean, he just had a success story with this guy, and I mean, Paul is preaching the word, and he says here that he was kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching. And you think to yourself, but why would God do that? Well, Paul knew he was supposed to preach, and Paul had a plan. And that is the problem. Don't you ever find, especially in the last year or so, that when you have your own plans, and then God changes those plans. <laughs> I mean, how many of you had a completely different plan for last year and this year? And then how many of you have completed those plans? Paul had a good plan which never ever happened. Because God said, I don't think so, Paul. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, keep reading in verse 7. This is what it says. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter the finger, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go in. The Spirit of Jesus showed up and says, No, you're not going in. So wait a minute, I mean, you have Jesus himself this is not just the Holy Spirit, but that Jesus himself saying no to your plans. I just want to say this really fast. Paul's life of significance did not always look like success. Why do I say that? Because right now, before we go any further, I need to pop a bubble in the room. And sometimes, the way that our Christianity can really go sideways is that I just want to say this, is that a life of significance doesn't always look like success. A life of significance doesn't always look like success. It just doesn't. Sometimes you've got to do what God is asking you to do even if it's not what you want to hear. And you do it with such faith, and no one builds you a monument when you do that. I mean, you find out that, um, that you think to yourself, you're moving in God's spirit, and you're doing His work, and, and you think, people are going to acknowledge, people are going to build a monument for me, or give me any praise, and you know what? It actually ends up costing you rather than being acknowledged. Sometimes you show up and no one notices. No one notices that you show up. No one notices that you are the first one there. No one notices that you are involved in everything that your pastor asks you or the church to get involved. Sometimes it doesn't feel successful. But that doesn't mean that your life isn't significant. And there's a distinction there. And what you are doing is, in fact, significant. Sometimes we have great plans, really godly plans, and God says, no. No. And when God says no, that might be the most important part of the journey to living a life of significance. 
So let's carry on to verse 8. So they passed by Messia and went down to Troas. Now here's a question. We are about to find out where does Paul go when God keeps on saying no. Where is Paul going to go when it feels like, well, God just keeps on saying no? Well, he has two options. The first one, he can go back to why he knows he can win it. I mean, he was doing very well before he, he started traveling again. If Paul's life was driven by success, then he will go back to Turkey and Asia because that's where things were happening. Because, you know, back then people liked these servants. People were, were coming to Christ. I mean, there were crowds coming to Christ. Back then in Turkey and Asia, back then he had good friendships. No one was trying to kill him. If he wants to win, then he should head back to where God was working powerfully. But that's not what Paul does. He goes to Troas. Now in Troas, you need to know, he's on the edge of that continent. Okay? And the edge of where the gospel has gone so far, and right on the other side of the ocean is a new place called Macedonia. And there is no a single convert in what we know today as modern day Europe. There is no one convert to Christianity on the other side. And something about Paul saying this, listen to this, and he said it probably to himself, I know what I can do to win, but that's not what I was made for. I wonder if this is a conversation that Paul has in his head. I was made for this moment and God put him to preach the gospel and to extend and advance the, 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 the kingdom of God. But that's, he comes to this place on the edge and, and he thinks to himself, well, why am I here? Why am I standing here? There's no one, there's this ocean and then on the other side of Macedonia, I know there is no one who knows Christ. Back, back in Asia, back in Turkey, I was a different person. People knew me every day someone was coming to know Christ. And then comes verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision. A quick clarification point here, he didn't have a dream. Paul had a vision. You see, you have a dream when you what? When you see. Okay? So it's the middle of the night and Paul didn't have a dream and sometimes God works that way. Paul, it says he had a vision. Well, what does that mean? Sometimes God works in that, in that way and something must have kept Paul up for him to not have a dream. He wasn't sleeping, but he had a vision. And I can imagine Paul praying on the side of his bed, saying, God, show me the love that you made me for. And I think that in that moment, Paul has a vision, and God, God shows up, as always he does, and he gives him a vision. He says, Paul had a vision of what? Of a man. Not a crowd like he took him. Of a man. One single man. And carries on and he gave him a man because he wants us to see people so that we can see the value. In a crowd, it's difficult to see people. It's difficult to see people. But why do we buy them? Eyeball to eyeball, there is this ability to see the person, to see beyond just the physical, but to see into that person's. Eyes. You know, I heard once, and you heard me say it before, that the word intimacy comes in from the word into my eyes, you see. And that's what God wants us to have is intimacy. And he carries on and he says, Again, a man of Macedonia, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And, and Paul takes a peek at this, and I just love this. 
Because in verse 10, this is what it says. After Paul had seen the vision, we, not, not all of them saw the vision, but all of them went after the vision. As it said, Paul had a vision. He didn't say they all had a vision. He didn't say the angel came and, and, and spoke to all of them. He said, Paul had a vision. Not all of them had a vision, but all of them were ready to follow the man with the vision. Are you, are, are, are you seeing this? It says, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. At once. It's the same as, as we spoke about Peter, right? I mean, Philip and, 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 and the guy on the desert road, the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, straight away he moved. And here again it says, at once we left for Macedonia. There was no committee meeting, there was no congregational meeting, there was no way to make it, Lord, let me pray if this is a vision from you or not. At once, at once, they left, we left for Macedonia, concluding something hit us like it never hit us before. I mean, they concluded, they saw, they saw Paul had a vision, he probably told them what the vision was, and so at once they said, okay, well, what are we waiting for? Let's, let's go, let's be ready. If this is your vision, we follow you, let's get ready. Why? Because we concluded, we concluded that God had called us, not just you, to preach the gospel to you, to them. Those who've never heard it before. They were taking risks. We, we spoke about routine and, and, and risk. They were taking a risk. Have you ever had that moment in your life when, when you recognize that God has called you, and that's why, and and, 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 and you think yourself, I, 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 I need to go in that direction. They got it, and and and, and they follow. And God says, "I have a plan for you. You're going to take the gospel to a place that you've never been, and and if you say yes to that, you will never be saying." Yes to your plans. I don't know if you've ever had an encounter. I've had it many, many times. But I don't know how many, how many of you know this this story. But how did we land up here in Queenstown? At the same time, I was nine months before that. I was supposed to be doing a wedding for a couple. The man was from a Jewish background, and the woman was, was not Jewish. And I promised this couple that I was going to do the wedding, and it was in a Drakensburg, in a, in a town. And they were going to pay for Tammy and I to go and, and uh, spend the weekend there, and even ask us if we can drive their car back, and they will fetch it when they come back from the honeymoon. And what happened in, in, in that period of nine months before the wedding, the denomination asked myself and a couple of guys to lead a delegation and go to Thailand. Uh, we were, I was a facilitator for a course called Kairos, which was about evangelism, and they wanted us from South Africa to represent South Africa in Thailand. For 10 days, trip to Thailand, all expenses paid with a little bit of pocket uh, money, you know, spending money. Who would say no to that? I mean, I had my passport already, I had no problem because I was doing two years off, so my passport was always ready. And of course, I was going to put my first hand up. I mean, they asked me to lead this delegation. What an honor, what a, what a responsibility. But I said, no. You try and tell a, a bride <laughs> that you promised that you were going to do the wedding for me that you can't because you'd rather go to, to Thailand. So I said no, and the joke around was, well, this how I would rather go to the Drunkensburg than to Thailand. Um, but I went to the wedding, I didn't go to Thailand. And I was doing the wedding there, as I was doing a whole lot of other weddings. And then we, we, we said we had a reception. 
And we met this couple who were sitting at their reception. The man's name was Clark Granger and his wife, Faye Ranger. Granger. And we were just being ourselves. I mean, we had no kids. The kids were, were at home. Someone was looking after them. We had a weekend to ourselves, so my wife and I were just enjoying a nice time at the reception and so on. Unknown to us, Clive was, is from this congregation. And unknown to us, Clive spoke to the session clerk at that moment, at that time, and the session clerk spoke to the rest of the board and the, and the elders at that time, and uh, they sent a letter to me a week after we came back, saying, you know, would you like to come and minister to us and see if with the future call? Now, in my conversation, I thought that the person said that the church is in Queensborough, which is lacquer, it's by the sea. <laughs> it, it, it's nice and warm, and it's by the sea, and there's no potholes in Queensborough, and electricity goes off only where there is no channel. But in the other conversation, she said, no, 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 not Queensborough, it's Queenstown. We didn't have a clue what Queenstown is or what. So we flew here to spend the weekend. Some of you will remember when I came here and just preached and had a lot of interviews and stuff like that. Do you remember interviews? Hey? And uh, within two weeks later, we were offered a call. And it was six years ago, almost seven years ago. But I was on my way to Thailand. Those were my plans. I mean, all the expenses paid with a little bit of pocket money. Who would say no? God said no. I don't want you over there. I want you to do the wedding in the Krakensburg because I have something better for you. And Paul, I just love this. He concludes that God has called him to preach the gospel to them. Can, can I throw a little bit of a hard commentary here? And, and when I read this, I, can, I can't help myself think that Paul is saying, if you want to live a life of significance, you need to, I need to, we need to stop trying to be successful. Sometimes in order for us to step into a life of significance, we have to go to get eyes of our plans, our hopes. We have to prayfully put ourselves in a place where we say, God, I know you made me. What do you want to use me for? Give me a vision. And if you think about it, success is about giving your life for a dream that you have for you. Significance, on the other hand, is what happens when you give your life for a dream that you have for someone else. And all of a sudden, it's not just that you had a dream for them, but, they had, but you have com compassion for them. You have a, a heart for them. You have hope for them. And something wells up inside of you for them. So let me say this again. Life of significance is having a vision for other people. So let's go to verse 12. Verse 12. From there we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony, and a living city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. Verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gates to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now let me explain what this is all about. So usually when Paul steps into a city, he goes in straight into the synagogue because he's wanting to bring the gospel to the Jews. And where are we going to find the Jews most of the time, especially on the Sabbath? In synagogue. Okay? And that's what, what Jesus taught him to do. Jesus went to the synagogue. Jesus went to the temple. That's what Jesus did. So that's what Paul does. He taught in the synagogue. And, and, and so Paul also went to the synagogue. But he shows up to this huge city, the 
this massive, important city, and he sees that they don't have a synagogue. Why don't they have a synagogue? Why is there no synagogue? Because to have a synagogue, you should at least have 10 men over the age of 13. And that city didn't have that. So what they did, they went to the place where they're going to meet. And we, we know from Jewish customs of that day that if you don't have a synagogue, then you will go back to a place of ceremonially sort of clean and pure, like a stream. And then those men, those Jewish men, not ten, because if there were ten, there would be a synagogue, and they would be there. So Paul and his companions go looking to find men of the city. So what happens? Well, let's carry on reading. We sat down and began to speak to whom? Who are you are speaking to? To men, to women who had gathered there. Not men. It says we began to sit and speak to one woman. No, a whole lot of women. Again, Paul is probably like, Lord, didn't you give me a vision? God, I'm normally used to ministering to men. We have a connection there. You know, I, I, I think more comfortable ministering to, to men. And, and, and there are no men. There's just this group of people and, and the woman. And verse 14 carries on and says, One of those listening was a woman from the city of Tartara named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. Now, why is that important? Because in those days, purple was not a usual color. You had to dye your clothes, your garments, purple. And to get a purple dye was very expensive. So purple became an expensive cloth. Purple is also a color of royalty. So only those of royal descent or only those of noble descent would be able to have the money to buy, to buy, to buy purple cloth. So what do we know about this woman? She's, she's a woman, a businesswoman, not just a woman, but she's a businesswoman, and she trains in this very expensive clothing, because it's purple. God is busy connecting Paul to one of the most significant leaders in the entire city. But what else? Well, let's carry on. She was a worshipper of God. Now what does that mean that she was a worshipper of God? It means she was not a Jew, but a Greek who believed in God. She believed in the principles of Yahweh, but she didn't know Jesus yet. But I love the next thing. It says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. The Lord Open our heart to respond to Paul's message. Now the word open in the word in, in, in the Greek is the word diagnel, okay? Or, or rather diagnel diagnel. And, and what does that mean? Well, she hears the message and all of a sudden she's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. She hears this message. And all of a sudden her heart opens and, and it's not just opening as in something is closed and then it opens, but the word in the Greek means it's a new opening. It's a holistic understanding. All of a sudden she's connecting the dots in her own life, realizing why something happens here and something didn't happen here and why she finds herself by the side of the river a businesswoman, a wealthy woman, wouldn't be just standing on the side of the river. That's where the other woman who would collect water for the husbands and her homes would be. Not a businesswoman. And all of a sudden, as she hears the word of 
God, as it is preached by Paul, it says that the Lord opened her heart. You see, this is what happens when you live a life of significance. Living a life of significance is showing up to the people and the opportunities that are right in front of you. And why do I say that? Because Paul wanted to go to another place, remember? And the Holy Spirit stopped him. And then he wanted to preach, and, 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 and then Jesus himself stopped him. And God said, No, Paul wanted to take his best friend, you know, that powerful combo. And God said, No. And Paul says, Okay. So when I get there, you go to connect me to some men, right? Because I'm good with men, I connect with men. And God says no. But that's the difference, isn't it? A life of success gets to pick the people that we want to bless and give to and share with. Why? Because it's what we are like. And, and we know that if we're going to connect with certain people, or it's going to benefit us. But for Jesus, it was so different because when he spoke about a life, he said yes to that life. You do not need to throw a party, but when you do it, you do what? I want you to invite some people that are not going to necessarily be invited to that party. Because what we want is we want the CEO to be invited to our party, not the janitor. And, and God says, no, the other way around. We don't need the CEO. We need to speak to the janitor. Because Paul shows up to the people and the opportunity in front of them. Lydia became the very first convert in Europe. And when that girl comes to Christ, Wow, what a powerhouse. I mean, she's unbelievable. Look at the next verse, verse 15. When she and the members of her household, hold on, where did her household come from? We, we told that Lydia is in. They were not in that group. But she responded to the message, and when she was like, you know what? And she the Lord open her heart, she's probably like saying to Paul, listen, just wait here, I just really need to go and fetch my, my family, I need to fetch my household, my, my maids, my, 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 my butlers, my, the guy who looks after the animals, I, I need to get them all there. Wait a minute, actually, I need to get my neighbor as well, and her household, and wait a minute, you know what, I'm going to call the guys in my office and tell them, day off, you guys are coming to the river. She's like, she's like this powerhouse. She just can't stop talking about Jesus. And it carries on and it says, We're baptized. She invited us to her home. And she said, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, Come and stay at my house. And it says that she persuaded us. Have you ever met someone like Lydia? Eh? Lydia is on, on fire. I love this. I remember I had once Lydia in, in, in my life. And um, I was doing some, some street evangelism. And I was just volunteering still with Jesus for Jesus. And remember I spoke to you about that time in America. And I was every now and again on a weekend I was volunteering with Jesus for Jesus and we would go to specific places in Johannesburg where we knew there were a lot of Jewish people so that we could minister to them. And, and, and once again, I don't know why, but I always ended up in a place where there was no one to speak to and everyone else was in another place. And, and, and I remember standing in a place and there was hardly anyone that he was there to give any gospel text to. And, uh, and all of a sudden there was this like, old lady, she was an Anglican lady, and, um, and, and she comes to me and she says, Hi, I, I need you to come over there. And I don't know if you've ever had someone 
sort of like grabs you and, and asking you at the same time to come with them, but they grab you and don't even have the, the time to answer and say, yes, I'll go with you. And you sort of, before you know it, you're already being moved to the other place. Okay, this lady, this little old Anglican lady was with Lydia. And she moved into this other place, and then there was like maybe about 10, 12, maybe even more people, and they were sort of standing there in like a semicircle. And, and she says to them, Listen, you know, I, I, I want to speak to you about Jesus from a Jewish perspective, but I grew up as an Anglican, I'm a deacon in the Anglican church. So, yeah, and she says, That's me, and I'm a new believer. And she says, But the guy's going to tell you about Jesus. That was Lydia. Lydia just like, she was on fire. She, she, the Lord opened her heart. And, when she collected all those dots, she just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Have you ever met someone like Lydia? Maybe you are a Lydia. You see, living a life of significance is surrendering what you have so others can have hope of Jesus. Do you know a Lydia in your life? You know that some scholars, some scholars say that Lydia, she eventually had this, this uh, house church and it was growing. Remember she was the first convert to Europe and then she has this house church because there were no church building at that time. And some scholars will, will believe, believe that later on a certain lady came to that house church and after visiting Time, she herself gave her life to the Lord, and later on, that lady's husband became the emperor of Rome. His name was Constantinople. And she invited him to this Bible study or this home church that used to belong to Lydia, and, and he gave his life to the Lord. And you know what Constantinople did? If you know your history, he was the first Christian emperor. And what he did, he then decreed that the whole of the Roman Empire had to listen to the message of Jesus. The same emperor, the same empire, the Roman Empire, years earlier, were instrumental in the crucifixion. For the same empire was the emperor who went with his wife to the home of the slave Lydia that the Lord heard in her heart. Why? Because Paul wanted to stay in Turkey. Paul wanted to preach in Korea and the Holy Spirit said, No, I want you to go and be. Because I've got a life of significance waiting for you to be. There is something so powerful about living a life of significance. And when you start surrendering what you have so others can have the hope of Jesus, if you listen to the Holy Spirit when it says no, and not go, what? Well, I want to go to Thailand. I've never been to Thailand. I want to ride on those elephants. And it doesn't help you when your friends send pictures on Facebook at the wonderful time they're having in Thailand eating sushi and all that kind of stuff. And you're preparing to go to the drunkards. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe God is busy saying no. Because he's got a life of significance for somewhere else. And you think, but God, I deserve this. I worked so hard for this. I want this. And God says, I know. But I've got something better on the day. I've got something better on the day. So wherever you are, maybe God is saying no because he's got a life of significance for you. Amen.
Amen. Let us sing for the benediction.